Hello and welcome. You're dealing with the combination of problems you face as a content marketer in B2B plus coronavirus. We're here to talk with leading content marketers, top marketers, and business leaders about how you can prepare for the rebound. Today, we are so lucky. We have Jim Roos with us, and he is one of the most influential people in banking. He is a top five fin fintech influencer to follow, and in addition to having advised the White House in the past, he's an internationally recognized financial industry expert, co-publisher of the financial brand, owner and publisher of the Digital Banking Report, and host of the Top 10 Banking podcast, Banking Transformed. He's been in more traditional and financial media outlets than I can list here. And let me just dive into the questions, Jim. Thank you for being here. Hey, it's great to be on, Leslie. Thank you very much. It's an honor. Would you tell us a bit about you and your role in the financial services industry and how much you've covered the COVID-19 pandemic's impact on the banking space? Yeah, so as a little bit of a background, I uh, came out of uh, college many, many years ago and went right in the banking industry. I, I worked for a local bank here that has since changed its name and become part of another bank, as many banks have, and spent about 15 years in traditional banking. And then I moved over to the marketing services industry where I was in a direct marketing and database marketing company, different companies for about 25 years. So about 20 years, I guess would be, and was serving the financial services industry. So I never went very far from it. And then come about 10, 11 years ago, I was worried about becoming irrelevant. I was at an age where sometimes I'd look at people that were spouting off what they wanted to talk about or what they wanted to sell, whatever it may be. And I found that at a certain age, um, people became a little bit of a, a coasting stat, uh, status. So they would, they would not have as much up-to-date knowledge. And I said, I don't want to be that person. So I said, the way to do this is to continually learn about what's going on in the industry. I then would publish it. And at that point, it was a blog. Um, truly was as categorized as a blog. It was anywhere from 200 to 500 words, which is a whole lot shorter than I do now. And, and what year was that, Jim, when you started the it was a, It was 11 years ago. So, wow, that's great. Yeah. And, and I was 55. And um, I, it was really a mission to say, I'm going to continually share to the industry what I was doing. It was a, a door opener, to be honest with you. I was writing articles about other people's research. It was a door opener for the sales side, but it was also a way and, and it's one of these things that you, you kind of look back and go, geez, I was smarter than I thought I was. And it looks like it was more planned than it was. But by educating myself and publishing something, I had to continuously replenish that bucket. So I learned something, I share it, it's gone. I got to find something else new. And so I was publishing twice a week, the same way I am now. I'm publishing on Mondays and Wednesdays or Mondays and Thursdays every week about things going on in the industry. Well, I stopped doing it about the second year for a summer to follow my son playing lacrosse. And when I came back, the reaction was kind of interesting. Number one, people said, number one, they thought I died, which, which showed me that, yes, I was right about wow. being, at, being at an age where people might think you're packing it in. And secondly, I realized that people really cared about what I was doing. And it was, again, early in the, um, the content marketing phase. It was also the beginning of social media. So I was always promoting what I was publishing on Twitter and LinkedIn the same way I do today, therefore keeping a cycle of information that was flowing. Well, in the third year I was doing this, I realized I had a million site views in the third year of my, my little blog awesome. and, and started talking to a gentleman by the name of Jeffrey Pilzer, who owned and, and was uh, the producer of a, a firm or a publication called The Financial Brand. We joined to, we decided to join forces and the rest is history. I mean, I, I, I not only started writing for them twice a week, but in addition, um, bought a digital banking report business. And um, last July, I started a podcast. So what was interesting, the, the whole issue of me being a top 10 uh, fintech uh, content marketer and all that really came out of the fact that I brought together content social media at the same time at the very beginning. And so 
it probably is as much because of the number of uh the number of followers I have on LinkedIn and Twitter may be a function of how long I've been doing it as much as the content, but my ability to, you know, it's been an amazing ride because my ability to speak to audiences worldwide is also because of my writing, my ability to, to, to write for different publications, my ability to see the, you know, visit the White House, all that came about because of it. But part of it also, and I, I think this is important for your audience and, and yourself, is it was a passion. I mean, I'm not doing something that I consider work. I'm doing something I consider a lot of fun. I also consider myself paying it backward. I'm paying it back to the industry that's been so good to me. I love the banking industry. I love the transformation that's going on. I love the digitalization, the technology, the innovation. And now, as much as any time, to get to your question a little slowly, is, is a time of massive daily change. But again, the gap between what financial institutions are doing and what consumers want is really around digitalization, content, and the ability to communicate to a vast audience in a way that's easy for them to absorb, which is really what we're all talking about. Great, got it. Are there any positives that came out of the COVID-19 crisis within the banking industry? Well, th there have been. Um, it, it has been disruptive. But the banking industry, by nature, has been slow to transform themselves to the modern era of, of digital communication, digital engagement. Um, they've been very physical structure based. I mean, you just look around neighborhoods and, you know, it used to be that uh, it still is the fact that uh, there's as many bank branches are gas stations and, and they're overwhelming. Um, they're oversaturation. I think what COVID did was in a nanosecond, you had a heart, what we call a heart attack moment. You had the realization that if you weren't already able to deliver what you had digitally in the way that Amazon and Google and many other firms can do, you were really stuck. You had to quickly transform yourself to be able to deliver on a digital platform because no longer were people able to visit the inside of a branch. No longer were people able to deposit a check in a normal way. And many people were very uncomfortable with that, you know, and on top of the fact that consumers are sometimes uncomfortable, it was probably because financial institutions didn't overtly promote it. Much like the retail industry, my wife comes out of the retail industry and she remembered, she went from the store base to the, for, to the digital side and she would get all kinds of competition from the store based people that said, you're taking business away from us. And she goes, no, I'm simply serving what the consumer wants. And the challenge is the same thing was going on in banking. The bankers in your local branch didn't want digital banking to, to take hold because pretty much their jobs depend on people visiting the branch. Well, the visits to the branch have gone down probably 60% over the last decade. And so organizations are having to realize that, geez, what do I do? Some organizations are modernizing their branches, which I think is pretty, pretty much putting lipstick on a pig. I'm not too sure if that's the right challenge that they should be facing. On the other hand, Organizations, if you say you're doing an account opening digitally, but you make the consumer come into the branch, where were you when COVID hit? You could no longer open accounts. So the, one of the positives to the banking industry is it immediately said, you've got to get on board digitally. And, and again, one of the challenges for the banking industry, they were going through a time of prosperity before COVID-19. They were at the high point of high as far as financials. There was no reason to change. And that's why we call it the heart attack moment. If you go to the doctor three times in a row, three years in a row, and they go, you know, you got to do this, this, this. And, and you go, yeah, okay. But the next time you visit, he goes, you know what? It looks like you're dying. If you don't change your diet and your exercise regimen, you're going to have a problem. It's amazing how behavior can change when you have to do it. In addition, I think financial institutions are realizing their role in the community. The government's given them a, a number of access tools between the small business PPP loan and the consumer stimulus packages to, be, to take a role of really serving the consumer and the small business. Some banks have done well with it. Some have done terribly. I will say that my financial institution, my, my business bank, has done a terrible job of reaching out to me They've not personalized communication. They've obviously communicated to me as a group, as a small business group. And it was interesting because for the two months prior to COVID-19, my bank was reaching out to me once a month saying, hey, 
you know, let's sit down, let's talk about your retirement funds. You said you wanted to consolidate in one place. We'd love to have your business. They haven't called me yet since it happened. Now, oh. I realize they're busy, but small business people like myself have long memories. Once we get a chance to go back into the branch, I feel like I'm going to have the, the Julia Roberts moment uh, shopping on Rodeo Drive and going, you know what? You, you miss your opportunity. And, and I think they have. So some organizations have responded very well. Other ones haven't done nearly as well. Got it. How is the banking industry trying to help small businesses, community businesses to be prepared for the rebound after COVID-19? It's interesting. Um, it's not based on size. I think some of the biggest organizations do a pretty good job because they have the tools, but we've seen some great stories from small financial institutions that have really rallied. When the SBA came out with a PPP loan, there's a small institution in Edmond, Oklahoma, that I believe has one or two branches. They went 24 hours straight to be able to respond to how to deliver the loan packages that the government dropped on their desks at the end of the day on a Friday. I can't even were, imagine. Oh, and they and they were possibly, I don't know for sure, a paper-based organization when it, with regard to SBA loans. They found a partner that helped them build a platform that allowed them to digitally do the loans. And they were a very active organization within the community. In addition, they came out the week before and said, hey, any of our customers, consumer customers, we know now what the government has approved from a stimulus package for consumers we will let you overdraw your account by the amount of the check you're expected to get. And you don't have to worry about paying us back until you get your check. Wow. They were, they, Mark Cuban recognized both what they did on the consumer basis and on the small business basis to rally the troops. They've done other things since then. As you can imagine, the transformation from a branch-based organization to a digital organization for the consumer is difficult. We see it sometimes when you go past branches and you see the t auto teller line is way down the street. This organization said, you know what, we're going to handle this just like Chick-fil-A. We're going to put representatives with masks on in the line and saying, I think we can help you do what you want to do at the auto teller on your phone. They show them how to make deposits, how to make transfers of funds, how to check their balances, all these things that the consumer was not able or not willing to embrace. But they said, you know what, we're going to get you out of this 40 minute line. We're going to show you how to do it. Now, since they've taken another uh, perspective of the restaurant industry and they've built specific uh, drive up lanes in their parking lot for people to call ahead if they have a transaction that had to be done on the branch, the branch employee comes out takes their deposit or whatever they, th if they needed coin, their small business need coin, they'll go inside, they'll transact the business and come out with the result. So this is innovation on the most basic scale, but the com community understands they're there for me. You know, and, and we have a lot of different situations. The SBA PPP loans went to bigger small businesses, not to the smallest players. They didn't go to the restaurant with 10 employees. Now, that was partially the fault of the small business because a lot of them didn't have the, the wherewithal to know what their opportunities were. But some financial institutions have reached out to those businesses and said, said let's sit down. Let's do it on a, a Zoom call like this. Let's figure out how we can bring you the solution. And I think that's where, I think empathy and the ability to be a sustainable business on the banking side is really going to pay off because I think Consumers coming out of COVID-19 are going to remember the pain they felt. And they're going to remember, you know, has this organization really done well by me at a time when they didn't even take their own interest into account? Got it. I hear partnership too. Empathy, innovation. People um, before profits. And by the way, people before profits is a very profitable proposition. <laughs> yes, yes. Got it. And I get that uh, what you're saying, the flip side of that, the bank that wasn't in communication yeah. where before they were when they saw opportunity for themselves exactly. and you, yep. and now there's no opportunity for them. It was just you and they've gone quiet. Yep. Yeah. That speaks volumes. 
what has COVID-19 revealed within the banking community that we wouldn't have seen or the banking community wouldn't have seen had it not happened? Well, one thing for sure was the, what I'll call the fake digital players versus the real digital players. A lot of organizations gave the impression that they really knew what the consumer wanted and were delivering it digitally. But the reality is, you know, while they maybe had a mobile app, the mobile app was clunky. You know, if you ever have applied for a loan with Rocket Mortgage or tried to apply for a credit card from Amex, Amex is a very different process. Amex, for instance, says, here, give us your social security number and your mobile phone number and your name. That's all we need. They'll get back to me within three minutes, tell me if I'm approved or not for American Express card. Now, how do they do that? Well, they take your name, your social security number to run a credit bureau to get all the other information they need to fill in all the forms that most organizations make me fill in. Why do they take my my, uh, cell number? Because they know I'm going to respond quicker to a text than waiting for an email. A text rattles my phone. An email doesn't. So what's happened is we have found out the gap of those organizations, the gap of learning, the gap of technology, and also I think financial institutions have figured out that even the gap in the way you do work. We have a a financial institution in the Northeast uh, in Maine that is a very big organization, have a very big call center. Well, in a matter of 24 hours, they had to go local. They had to go to their home base to do the call center operations. Well, TD Bank, which is the name of the bank, found that this is working pretty well. So going back, very much like Twitter and some other firms, they're going to give the employee the option. Do you want to come in or do you want to work from home? It doesn't make any difference for us. For them, the technology was already in place to be able to monitor calls, to know how long the calls are, who they were with. So the, the organizations that were prepared for a digital future, we're in the best position. And I think also, not just the banks, but the s- companies that serve banks. So while the banking industry was upended, so were all the companies that serve the banking industry. So in a, again, a matter of 24 hours, salesmen were taken off the streets, events were canceled, and organizations had to say, how do I reach out to my customer base and show them that I'm active? They're not seeing, they're not seeing our salespeople. They may see them on a a Zoom call, but it's going to take a while to figure out what that's all about. So what happened is they reached out to firms like myself to say, we need content. What can you give us to to show them that we're going to continually be on their side? How can we educate our customers about what they should be doing in this thing? Because most financial institutions were completely, as everybody was, uncharted territory. Now, what's going to be interesting, the banking industry, do I need a 45-story bank building anymore? when two thirds of my employees could very easily work at home. This has been a revelation that says, you know, we were always worried about the trust factor about working from home. You know, are they going to do their daily work? Well, I think they've seen, you know, where it's worked, where it hasn't, where collaboration is still possible, where it isn't, where innovation can move forward without having people around a a boardroom table. And in fact, you know, I've been, I've been in the boardroom side, We sometimes would invite everybody possibly could for a meeting, despite the fact that many people didn't have to be there. What's happened is Zoom calls quickly um, weed themselves out. If people aren't feeling like they need to participate, all of a sudden we see the picture come up, the static picture, we go, okay, they've either gone to the bathroom or they've completely left the meeting, but they're certainly not participating anymore. And so we're, we're learning about people, we're learning about business, and we're learning about digitalization. How many years do you think of progress have these banks been forced into, the ones who weren't prepared for digitization? Uh, You know, it's interesting. We have jumped forward probably a decade if you looked at the speed of change prior to this. But we've seen the same thing with payments. So the consumer is re-looking at the way they make payments. Number one, as you could be expected, the use of cash is way down. Why? Because the World Health Organization very early in the COVID crisis said, you know, cash might be able, cash and coin, coin even more than cash, which was kind of interesting, might be able to carry the virus. 
So what do people do? I'm going to use plastic. Well, then all of a sudden, very quickly, people realize, if I lose plastic the traditional way, I can still push in my four digits. So I'm, I'm at a grocery store with all this plastic up and people with masks. And they're asking me to touch the same screen that 20 people before me touched. So all of a sudden, contactless payments becomes important. Also, mobile wallets. I no longer go to the store and say, okay, I'm going to use this and I'm going to punch in the things. No, I use my mobile wallet and have all take care of there. That's why the transactions at PayPal, Square, Venmo, Zelle have all skyrocketed. Because also, if I wanted to pay you, I don't think I'm going to be writing a check or paying you in cash. I'm going to find ways to do this digitally. And so the consumer and the way they're transacting. Now, also helping that is the fact that, not surprisingly, shopping at Amazon has just gone through the roof. So people are understanding about digital transactions and purchasing things online if they hadn't already. But I, I look at also the way that people realize I can have my groceries delivered and I don't have to expose myself to the challenges of walking to a grocery store, going down the lane in the right direction, wearing the mask, ex, you know, put myself in a risky situation every day. I think we've already seen it. Grocery stores are a whole lot less busy. That's because 30% of people have at least tested delivery to home. And then you add communication. Um, if my parents were still alive, I would imagine that they'd be communicating with all of us using something like Zoom or FaceTime. Whoever wasn't familiar with it, I could go down my street right now, and I know I can knock on every door and say, do you know what Zoom is? None of us knew what it was before March 1st. We all know what it is today. And so the expectations of being able to communicate somebody face-to-face -face, where they may have used email or text before, be it a bank, be a hotel, be a restaurant, is going to lift the ability to build interaction in a different way. Got that. What is the banking industry doing to prepare for the rebound? First of all, um, some of them are what I'll call some negative ramifications. Number one, um, they're going to be under financial stress, just like the small businesses in their communities are. So the challenge is going to be of all these loan deferred payments, of all these um, small businesses that are struggling because, you know, the government package only took care of payroll. It didn't take care of ongoing operations. And most small businesses only had cash enough for six months at most. Will businesses be back to normal? By September? I don't think so. You know, because just because an organization says you can do business with us the way you used to, doesn't mean we're going to. So what's, what's happened is some banks have already stated that their, um, their appetite for home equity line of credit extensions, their appetite for small business lending is pretty much dried up because they're going to be in a risk-based scenario. So I think when you open the doors again, number one, you're going to see a whole lot different world. You're going to, you're going to walk into the branch at some point, and it may be, and you're going to look around going, you know, why am I here? I, I was able to handle this. You know, the longer we go, the more likely it is that a consumer is going to say, I can change the way I do what I've done. Why do I want to go into the car and do banking this way? Why do I want to go in the car and do grocery shopping that way or regular shopping that way? So it's going to really change things. So the ability to interact and to build relationships digitally is more important than ever. Um, financial institutions are also going to need to, as I've said, reach out to the community. Now, it doesn't all have to be loans. I've, I've worked with the small bank I mentioned in Edmond, or, or, uh, Edmond, Oklahoma, and said, you know, how about a program where you give grants to those small businesses that help other small businesses? maybe a web developer, maybe a, a company that knows how to do payment processing for a small restaurant, maybe a social media guru that can say, you know what, I can get your business back to normal by doing that. Or maybe it's just a consultant, in the re let's say in the restaurant industry that says, you need to change your business model. You've got to find a way to make it so people can order dinners regularly and have it delivered to their house in a way that's as normal as having gone out to dinner before. Because if you haven't done that, that's, that's gonna be a, a, a challenge. 
But if a bank was able to actually say, how can I build a synergy among businesses? How can I support a business that then supports another business? And the trickle down effect is going to be tremendous. So I think banks are going to be doing that as well. I can't hear you. Thanks. There you go. How will banking, yeah, my bad. I mute myself in no between problem. just so I don't flip the screens over, but yeah, yeah. No problem. Thanks. How will banking be better for having had this experience of COVID-19, Jim? There are going to be more digital organizations. I think uh, the government's working already with the financial institutions to look at some regulations that are outdated. So we have a regulation in the banking industry called Community Reinvestment Act. And Community Reinvestment Act made it very difficult for banks to close branches in lower income neighborhoods, despite the fact that as of the movement to payroll direct deposit and, and government checks being direct deposit, those branches weren't used anywhere near to the level they were back in the 70s and 80s. So what they're going to do is look and say, okay, how can we look at this investment differently? Because Traditionally, if you closed a branch, the government would hold it against you when you look to them for other guidance. Now they're saying, well, maybe you can close that branch, but what is your going to be your ongoing commitment to that community different than a branch office? I think that's tremendous because, you know, what, what is a static office? Even if you call it a community center, what does a static office give to a community as opposed to maybe having donations to local groups that reinvest that money in the community. So that's going to be a major change. I think there's the, the whole digitalization of banking is going to be better. I think the focus on sustainability and sustainability used to be how, how well you've taken care of the environment. Sustainability in banking is now viewed in a broader sense. How are you going to take care of the, the people that are underbanked or unbanked? How are you going to take care of those demographic groups that right now are suffering much more than your, 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 normal, your normal consumer. Um, we find that it's based on gender, it's based on race, it's based on income. I think financial institutions are really gonna be judged at how well they respond to those communities. Got it, that's interesting. Okay, so we've got you know about seven minutes left. Of the questions that you sent me, which would you like me to um, I think, I think, more. I think mm -hmm. one of the good ones that I like is, is, okay, so let's get out of the banking industry. Let's get back to how you transformed yourself. Mm -hmm. What recommendations yeah. do you give people Ooh, that is great. in an mm -hmm. environment like this or small businesses in a time like this? Awesome. Great. I can't hear you again. So, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that, dog on, that dog on mute button, man. I know. I love learning. It's <laughs> <laughs> good. Yes. So, Jim, as someone who's transformed himself a few times in his career, what advice do you have for people now to prepare themselves for the rebound, to stay relevant, to uh, be productive and come out the other side prepared? prepared? Well, we're seeing it different, different ways. We're already noticing the people are saying, I don't want this to happen again. So back in the banking industry, we're seeing savings rates escalate. We're seeing credit card uh, credit or debt being reduced. That's even from people that aren't sitting there with a whole lot of money at this point. But on a personal and a small business basis, I can, I've been saying this for years now. Number one, especially during this time when you're in lockdown, you're, you're able to adjust. Number one, go after what you're passionate about and get out of your comfort zone. And what I mean by that is every day, you're, there's something that really motivates you. Maybe it's gardening. Maybe it's working with the banking industry. Maybe it's collecting toy cars. You can make a business out of virtually anything and it'll be easier to make a business if you're passionate about what you're doing rather than just going through the motions. So number one, learn more about what you really love. Take this time. The best innovations in the world have happened 
during times like these. Sewer systems, street systems, medical care all came about because of pandemics. Alibaba, which is a financial institution out of China that, you know, Alipay and Alibaba, a very big organization, came out of the SARS epidemic. So these times of major transition, major disruption, have already got your psyche looking at everything differently. So think about what you're really passionate about. Double down your learning. Use LinkedIn, use Twitter, use Facebook, Instagram. Heck, you can use TikTok to find others that have the exact same passion that you have. By building your community around people like you, you'll learn more and you can share what they've learned. As you move your learning curve higher, you're gonna be in more prepar you're gonna be more prepared for the future. How much better is it when you go through something like this? And we're gonna go through something like this again. How much better is it to be focused on something you're really passionate about? rather than saying, oh my God, do I dread going back to what I was doing? For those who are unemployed right now, underemployed right now, that's 30% of the marketplace that's in a real stress position. Don't just pack it in. Now's the time to look at what you really wanna do. Embrace the change that's taking place. Take some risks. Heck, you have risk all around you right now and disrupt yourself. Hit that, hit that, have your own heart attack moment to change your behavior. I, you know, I think I shared with you, not only did I transform the way I did business, but a year ago, last January, I made the decision on the first of the year, I had to transform myself. I made a commitment to myself that said I had to eat different. I did not have the heart attack moment, but I decided, you know what, what better way when I go on the road to show how it can be done than to do it within myself. Over the next eight months, nine months, I got on a program that, that had me eating healthier, understanding the dynamics of what I ate, my relationship with food, my, my human nature aspects of that. In addition, after I lost some weight, I got into a workout routine, which all these things have been thrown off kilter right now because none of the gyms are open, but I, I, bought, a, I bought a treadmill because of the fact I said, I'm not gonna lose what I've gained. But during that period, I lost 55 pounds. And I completely changed my mental attitude with what I was doing. I've not, I think I've had two fast food meals and both of them have been on the freeway where there are no options available when I was getting off the turnpike. But I've had only two fast food meals. I was eating eight a week before, before my transformation. And now I'm able to share with others how they can transform themselves. I don't have it mastered yet. I still have a long way to go with my own transformation. But when you make a major change, as, as anybody who's ever moved careers completely realizes, once you do it once, you realize it doesn't kill you. And I actually have a t-shirt that says, um, did it kill you? And now I'm not wearing it because it takes on a different meaning. But the reality is, um, none of this change is life and death. Except that, how do you want to live your life? Do you want to live life, your life doing something you're really passionate about? or something you're just going through the motions. What do you want for your family? What do you want for your children? My son is a lacrosse player. He was a baseball player in eighth grade. And one day he just said, I'm gonna be doing lacrosse. He doubled down, he learned everything about it. And for eight years, and it's gonna be nine years now, cause he's going back, he loves lacrosse so much. He's going back to university and going to play out his eligibility, going back to school for an extra year, even though he's graduated or has the, has the courses to graduate. He can't actually graduate or he can't play, but he's made, a career out of at right now with lacrosse. He's going to transform himself again. My wife went from traditional retail to digital retail the same way. She was really good, really, really good in store-based retail merchandising. She decided one day, I've got to move with the marketplace. And when you do that, you realize it's a great feeling. So I, again, I probably used up all the time, but, but basically embrace something you're passionate about, pursue it with vigor, and it's easier when you love it. And then it, disrupt yourself. Change where you are today. Really great, Jim. Yeah. I uh, heard passion, learn all you can, build community, disrupt yourself, move with the market, embrace the risk because it's already here. And, yeah. and you know what? Overall, have an abundancy theory. Mm. And a, an abundance mentality says, 
just because other people are doing it doesn't mean there's not a market for me doing it as well. And the market may not be business. It may just be share a voice. You know, there's a lot of people that do what I do. My, my thought is, you know what? There's people that are going to like the way I do it differently than others. So let me mm -hmm. just get all of those people to embrace yep. what I'm doing. Yep. And the last point, we can say, did it eat you? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> nope, it didn't, did it? Nope. Wow, really great. Um, if you have just another 30 seconds, yep. I'd love to hear, do you yep. see yourself traveling internationally again for large industry events? <laughs> That's a great question. That's I, I tell my agent, I say, my ability to travel will probably, it will precede my desire to travel and my desire to travel will definitely precede my desire to be in front of 2,000, 3,000, 7,000 people. I have to rethink all that. I was telling somebody the other day, I will probably be more apt to want to get into a baseball stadium before a football stadium, just because of the congestion. Mm -hmm. But I'll probably deal with that because I now know when you're in contact with other people, what you need to do to lower your risk on those things. I, I need my sports. I need my music, my concerts. Um, but as far as traveling, because it's, it's optional, you have to make decisions. And, and you know, my, uh, it was interesting because my last trip, my last jo ver journey before COVID took place was to China, Seattle, California, New York, and Boston. Now, the conspiracy theorists will say, so I'm the guy who took it all these places, but I never got sick. But I look and I go, when's the next time I'm going to want to visit China, even though I love the area? When's the next time I'm going to want to, you know, I want to go to Paris. I want to go to these other countries, but maybe not to meet with 7,000 people. Maybe it's going to be for corporate meetings that involve the board and the, the senior officers of a company. So we'll rethink it. I'm sure we'll get better, but we're going to be cautious and we're going to, we're going to make our selections on our comfort level. So, you know, if one airline packs them in more than others, I'll make my decision as to where I want to, what, brands I want to follow going forward. I had my favorite brands before the COVID. They may change based on how they've handled this transition as well. Mm -hmm. I got it. And if you want to, I'm happy to ask you about what's changed in your personal business as a result of COVID-19 yeah, and perfect. any changes you're yeah. making, if you're okay for time. I don't, no okay, yep. thanks. Great. So Jim, in your own personal business, I know you've transformed a number of times in your life and continue to transform. How are you preparing for the rebound after COVID-19? My business is content business. It's a media company. Uh, we're the, the financial branch, the second largest publication in the banking industry. The digital bank report, I believe, is one of the, the most uh, vibrant primary research companies in the banking industry. My podcast has done very well, thanks to the guests that have been on this show. But I think what it was interesting was, it was actually before all the shutdowns were happening, I was seeing that people were being taken off the streets from salesman perspective for the solution providers. In addition, banks were closing and events were being canceled. And I said, you know what? These organizations that are selling to the bank industry, which to a degree, I'm talking to the bank industry, are going to say, I need to find a way to connect with these companies again. And so the way we transformed is we realized that there was a whole lot more content available. I'm doing webinars probably twice a week right now, um, uh, sponsored webinars for solution providers to get their message out to the banking community as to how should we go forward. I'm writing more articles. We're doing more podcasts. We've had some amazing guests that have talked about um, how business has changed. I, you know, I, I go back quite a ways, but there's a gentleman by the name of Tom Peters, who is thought by many to be the management and leadership guru from 40 years ago when he wrote In Search of Excellence. I was able to have him on the show, and he talked about the fact that wow. as much as things have changed, the reality is it's still about people. He was able to take what was happening in the past to the, to the current. I was able to have Steve Wozniak, uh, co-founder of Apple, on the show. I've, I've been lucky enough to have authors and leaders in the banking community and the, and the business community come on and say, you know, again, here's the way we move forward. And for me, this, I've never been busier. You know, it's mm. funny because myself and a gentleman down at the other end of the street, we're the, I think we're the two business, busiest old men in the street because he is in the um, tele, telehealth business. And he goes, uh -huh. it was busy before, but overnight, 
telehealth became, uh, you know, the only thing we're missing on the street is somebody coming up with a vaccine. That person would also be busy right now. But I think what you have to do is make the make lemonade lemon and realize that you've, you've got to move forward and find ways to serve a market that you've already established. Mm-hmm. Got it. Well, keep on transforming, man. Yeah. An inspiration. I keep Thank working, you. working. And as, as you know, the author record that, that my ability to communicate and try to move other items forward, my business forward. It, it's been like, how do I, yeah, you, you're too young to remember, but Ed Sullivan show used to have a, a part in the Ed Sullivan show where they took plates and he'd spin these plates on a, on a, on a stick or a, uh-huh. on a pole. And the guy would put more and more plates on and the, the whole, the whole event was around, he'd have at one point 40 plates going and you'd be watching the one that's going around about to fall and he'd come back and spin it. I feel like that guy right now that, that I'm, oh. I got a lot of plates in the air. I got a lot of balls going and I got to say, you know, which one gets priority every day. And, and it's interesting because as much as you kind of plan your day out, um, it, it changes. But again, it comes back to how much you love what you do and it doesn't make it work. You know, I come back to the desk after dinner many nights. I'm, I work on Sundays because I write articles on Monday. So my week is usually Sunday through Friday through Thursday. And I take Friday and Saturday kind of off or lower key. Those days have been gone. But I don't feel like I'm, I'm doing anything that's negative to the family or anybody else because I'm happier than Lark. I'm having a ball. That's awesome. It's a good place to be. And, and you awesome. know what? Yourself as well. I mean, look what you've done. Mm-hmm. You're saying, how am I going to look at this is the time to do something that I wouldn't have time for when things are normal. And you, oh, yeah. you sit, on a, sit on a day and you go, oh, geez, certain things aren't working out exactly the way I want to do. Okay, so what do we do about it? You know, mm-hmm. I can sleep, I can sleep in, I can go to bed early, I can watch TV, or I can listen to 20 podcasts, I can, I can educate myself. Education is the one thing that nobody can take away. And every time you do it, if you do it rather than just reading, and I don't mind reading books for pleasure, it's never been my thing, I read it for learning all the time. But every time you move a step forward, you don't have to re-step the, retrace those steps, which is pretty cool. It is. It is. Well, thank yeah. you for the acknowledgement. It's very generous of you. Yeah. Sweet. All right. Well, I'm going to stop the recording. Yep. Thank you so much.